Good morning. Welcome to worship here with us at Jubilee United Church from wherever you come from. From the lands which you are situated upon here, we give thanks for the Halk Malam and Squamish speaking peoples who have stewarded this land for long beyond our existence and will continue to be part of our lives. When we acknowledge our land and where we come from, it, it compels us to do welcome ourselves, to strive to be a church of inclusion and a place of being for all people. It shouldn't matter, and sometimes we know it does, but it shouldn't matter your economic status or your marital status, your sexual orientation or your gender identity, your race or your culture. We try to recognize that it is God who brings God's people together, and it is our diversity that welcomes us into this place and into wherever we gather from. We hope that you find welcome and that you find a word that speaks to you on this day and in the midst of all that we do. Today we give thanks for Colin Brown, our associate minister, who is uh, doing our prayers of the people, and Elizabeth McVicker, who's reading our scripture, joining us from their places of residence, and we're glad that they are with us. As we gather, we remind ourselves that we're not alone. We remind ourselves on the second Sunday of Easter that the light which shines in the darkness continues to shine. And so we light our Christ candle here on our table. And it reminds us, because it is a dancing flame, it reminds us that that flame connects us with the flame of everywhere. And so if you have a candle in your home that you'd like to light, you can be reminded that it connects you with the flame that is here dancing in our sanctuary. And it reminds us that it is like the light from beyond which all light comes. Not just the light in a candle or in a flashlight or when we turn on the electricity or from the sun, but the light from which all light comes. And that darkness cannot, has not, and will not ever put it out. This is the season of Easter, the celebration of resurrection, the festival of hope, the promise of new beginnings, the dance of faith, the song of joy, the music of gladness, the hymn of love. Let's see if you remember what we did last week. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us worship our life-giving God. And we pray. God of power, God of people, you are the life of all that lives. Energy that fills the earth, vitality that brings to birth impetus and making whole whatever is bruised or broken. In you, we grow to know the truth that sets all creation free. You are the song the whole earth sings, the promise liberation brings now and forever. You came to Thomas and offered him resurrection hope. Come to us in this time of worship and fill us with faith, hope, and love. Amen. Our children and youth did not gather this morning for Sunday school or church school. However, we're going to gather on Wednesday. Wednesday is Earth Day, and we want to have a chance to talk about uh, what that means as Christians and as people of faith with our children and youth. And so uh, if you are one of those that has children and youth and you want to be part of that, uh, I have sent out a doodle poll to find out what time works for you. And so uh, please respond to that, and we'll gather together in that time to, uh, to do an hour of just spending some time together and remembering what it is that we do and what we're called to. And uh, it is really good that we continue to gather with our children and youth because this story is one that you don't just get on Sunday, but that lives out every day. And especially in this season of Easter, we remember that this is not just a Sunday thing, that this is an everyday living. As we prepare to hear the scripture, I invite you to pray. O oh God, for whom there are no barriers, no stone too big to remove, roll away our resistance to you. Let your words fill us with new life and bring us out from the tomb of indifference, alive again in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we are attentive to the word of God. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning. This is a reading from the Gospel according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying through these ancient words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be graced by your wisdom and your love. Do you ever have doubts? Doubts like second-guessing yourself? Doubting the story that someone tells you, doubting that what you're doing matters. Perhaps they're existential doubts, like, will this pandemic ever end? Does it all even really matter? Are those who are in authority telling us real things? Does God exist? Is this resurrection thing even real? Don't worry, because you're not alone. It's quite all right to have doubts. They have a role in the life of faith. You are in good company if you have doubts, both in Scripture and in the church. And do you believe? You're in good company. Though much of Scripture warns us against letting our believing become too settled, rote, or domesticated, I once heard it said that you should never be comfortable in the pews in a church, not just physically, but you should always be being challenged. Swift's theologian Karl Barth says that the miracle stories and resurrection stories most of all are designed to astonish. And astonishment is a blend of belief and disbelief. Christians should neither merely believe miracle stories, for that would mean that we aren't truly astonished by them, or merely disbelieve, for that would also mean we aren't truly astonished by them. These stories should leave us continually taken aback, help us call into question our assumptions about what may or may not be possible and impossible, and invite us into an open-minded, open-hearted posture of Easter faith, and of Easter doubt, and of Easter joy. It is into this good company that we join today. It's the evening of the first day of the week, a day of new beginnings. Mary Magdalene has just declared to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and yet they continue to cower, holed up in a locked house for fear of religious authorities, and into that locked room, Jesus appears. Even after having been denied and deserted when it mattered most, Jesus still greets them, peace be with you, and then immediately shows them his wounds. I wonder why. Does he look so different that the wounds act as identifying marks? Or does he look more or less the same, but the wounds prove that he is the person they saw crucified rather than just a look-alike? Or is he trying to assure them that torture and death have been overcome? That he has somehow, like Lazarus, come out the other side? There weren't a bunch of people at his resurrection, as there were when Lazarus returned, but maybe this continued confusion about recognizing Jesus tells us something more. 
There is a recurring theme in the resurrection stories in all of the Gospels, that of which how the early Christian community struggled to perceive and believe. The risen Christ isn't recognized at first. Mary Magdalene thinks he's the gardener. The disciples won't recognize him on the beach. Two followers in Luke have an extended conversation with and about him without knowing who he is. This suggests that perhaps the resurrection means something more mysterious than simple resuscitation. Jesus has risen, and at the same time, he's somehow different. Maybe it helps explore the idea that resurrection defies conventional categories. Yes, Jesus may be back, but only few have eyes to see that it's really him. Even his closest followers need help. The disciples are locked in that room, perhaps with a fear that all has been lost. What they have been doing as they follow Jesus around the Galilean countryside doesn't even matter. Death has the final word, and nothing they have done to this point even matters. Or maybe they still have a suspicion that death still has dominion, that physical resurrection is impossible, that no one can die and rise again. I wonder if that's what Jesus is trying to tell them when he shows them the wounds in his hands and his side, that death doesn't have dominion. Maybe they're still wondering if this man they had followed around was truly the Messiah. The genuine Messiah would not arise from death in triumphant, vulnerable, invulnerable splendor, but rather as a suffering servant, still marked by his vulnerability, by fragility, by wounds. The true Messiah, acting on behalf of a wounded world, would rise as a wounded savior. So as a sign of authenticity, Jesus immediately displays his wounds. He is the word made flesh. And flesh means vulnerability. Flesh means wounds. And then Jesus is gone and Thomas returns home and he puts it all to question again. He doesn't believe them. And perhaps he begins to make them question themselves too. What did we really see? What was that? I wonder why Thomas wasn't in the upper room when Jesus first appears. The others are hiding behind locked doors, but he's out and about. Maybe he's still searching for the body of the Lord. Perhaps he's moved on, accepted what has happened, and is out and about rebuilding his life from the fractured pieces that were left to him after the horrific events of Good Friday. We've seen and heard Thomas before in this gospel. He likes things clear and concrete. He has challenged Jesus before, and he is courageous. He's the one disciple who declares, we will go to Jerusalem even if it means death. Because we know just this little bit about Thomas, I wonder if he was out trying to get things back to normal, putting them in order. Perhaps he's insistent on dealing with reality, on getting things back to normal, on moving forward now that the worst has happened. Perhaps he just wants to control just one thing when everything else seems out of control. I know that's what I do when things seem out of control. I focus on the thing I can control for that time being, reorganizing my bookshelves, taking all the dishes out of the cupboard and reorganizing them. Can you find yourself in Thomas's shoes, too? In this story, it's only been a few days since last seeing his Lord, his friend. It was Friday. And there he was, nailed to the cross in agony and isolation. Thomas is out, trying to make some sense of his life, trying to get back to normal. And he comes into the house, and he hears his friend's joyful confession, we have seen the Lord there's nothing normal about that. It sounds like wishful thinking. Perhaps they've been locked together in that room for too long. Thomas demands what the others have already had, the opportunity to inspect Jesus' wounds, which of the doubts that the other disciples had driven him. Fear that all is lost. Suspicion that the resurrection is impossible. Weariness that mere resurrection isn't enough, that only a wounded and risen savior is the genuine article. Maybe a little bit of all three. A week later, 
Jesus appears again. And Thomas is given permission to touch the wounds, to put his hand in Jesus' side. And immediately Thomas declares, my Lord and my God. He abandons the conceptions of normal and he opens himself to a very different reality than he could have possibly imagined because creation isn't just static, but still happening. Jesus asks, do you believe because you've seen? And blesses those who believe and have not seen. Jesus challenges and invites and blesses all of us to recognize that in light of the resurrection, the future is always open. The others had doubts too, and Thomas isn't any more willing to take their word for it than they were willing to take Mary's. The disciples refused to believe on the basis of testimony alone, but a new chapter is beginning in salvation history. A chapter in which the movement will grow and the church will be born, all on the basis of testimony. Jesus sends them with the breath of the Holy Spirit to announce the good news, to persuade on behalf of testimony of hearing but not seeing. It's as if Jesus says, and this was one of the things I read this week, so it's a block quote, I understand your need to see and touch my body in order to believe, and I will oblige. But there's an even deeper form of faith and trust, an even higher fear, gear of understanding that isn't dependent on signs and wonders or even on the presence of my physical body, but rather has the ears and eyes to discern with me, discern me within you and among you and throughout creation. And I call you and commission you toward that deeper faith, that higher understanding. Now I give you the Holy Spirit and send you out away from my physical body into an even deeper blessed intimacy with me. Even my resurrection, the sign of all signs, isn't the end of the road for you. With the Spirit's help, go, climb, and still higher. There is a more blessed faith beyond signs and wonders, the trust of those who have not seen. Resurrection is literally the standing again. These stories are not only of Jesus, but of the community of disciples, moving them from an inward-focused, locked-up fear to an outward-focused, liberated witness. Jesus' resurrection gives, fear, gives rise to their own resurrection, and they are in turn sent to proclaim with their lives and their words the good news of new life. Thomas and the disciples then and now are called to step out beyond a faith that depends too much on signs and wonders to grow beyond a seeing is believing form of Christian life. The signs in John are meant to point beyond themselves toward creation as a whole, toward God's love for that creation and towards the way we are commissioned to declare and enact that love in everything we do. Jesus wants to lead his followers into a faith that can flourish, even when what can be seen is dispiriting. Faith discerns beyond the visible, beyond the surface of things, and so lights a candle in the darkness, sings a song of hope in the valley of the shadow of death, even and especially when signs and wonders seem nowhere to be found. It's okay to have doubt. That's why we give thanks for Thomas. He doesn't believe until he sees with his own eyes. Thomas wants to get back to normal. How do you even talk about normal, though, when someone has been raised from the dead? What can possibly ever be the same? Your work, your sense of meaning, your relationships, your purpose, your view of past, present, and future, all of it is changed irrevocably by God's act of resurrection in the garden. What does it mean to go back to normal when we've been living in a world touched by pandemic? There's a quote I've been seeing on Facebook this past week a few times. It really speaks to me and to many of my colleagues and friends. I've seen it posted over and over. Sonia Renee Taylor writes, We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, Inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends, to normal. We are being given an opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity 
and nature. So maybe, rather than how soon until we return to normal, perhaps the question that we ask is what will the new normal be like? What can we carry forward from this experimental time? What part of our old patterns seems suddenly not just non-essential, but perhaps even not helpful in light of our reinvigorated sense of mission and connection and community? Will we care more about getting it right than being concerned about how it all fits into a much broader pattern of nurturing people in faith so they, in turn, can tend our larger communities? with both physical and spiritual needs? Will we be preoccupied with style of worship over its substance? Will we turn outward and recognize the painful but essential leveling effect of this virus to make us realize that we are all, individuals, congregations, communities, countries, all of humanity, inextricably bound to each other and dependent on one another the future is still open. God is still at work creating, recreating, and sustaining us to do things we could not have imagined previously. And we've been agile. We've been quick to respond in a lot of ways, and we know that things will continue to change. Jesus is there amidst the necessary changes and faithful adaptations calling us forward, blessing us to believe though we do not see, and promising to be with us forever. We, my friends, are on a journey. In the gospel story and in our own lives, from disbelief to faith, from one reality, back to normal, to a new one, there is no normal. But thankfully, we're not in it alone. We are together. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen. I invite you to just take a moment of silence to hold precious whatever is moving in your heart and know that the Spirit is moving within you. was beautiful. In these early days after the resurrection, we wonder what it all means. We can relate to Mary and her confusion in the tomb and her struggle to see Jesus despite her confusion. We understand the disciples scrambling to find Jesus despite their inability to understand that Christ had, had risen alive in the world again, even in a locked room. We understand the doubts of Thomas. We also keep company with the disciples as they try to find Jesus, as they try to move from fear and misunderstanding to faith and comprehension. We find ourselves in the eternal movement between fear and faith, doubt and conviction, wonder and worry, and we trust that you are present with us, O oh God. We trust that like the disciples, we will be able to stand and tell the whole message about this life, that love is stronger than fear, life has the final word over death, beyond what we can see with our eyes, there is a bond of humanness that draws and keeps us together. We watch with anxiety from our living rooms as, dangerous, as a dangerous virus spreads, as people suffer in New York and throughout the United States. We watch with anxiety as people suffer in China, Italy, Spain, France, and Britain, just to name a few. 
we must watch well the situations in nursing homes in BC, Ontario, and Quebec worsen. Many of us have experienced great anxiety over the financial uncertainty that this pandemic has created. Even those of us that have not personally known anyone that has contracted the virus have had their lives turned upside down. We give thanks for all those who practice social distancing or self-quarantine for the safety of others. Those who collect our trash and recycling, postal carriers and delivery people of every type, all those who work in healthcare, those who stock the shelves and operate the cash registers in our supermarkets, all those who provide the essential services that we continue to rely upon. We give thanks for people in countless hospitals and in countless places, to people who speak words of compassion in the face of uncertainty and suffering. In our own community, we pray for all those who have face, faced challenges. God, hold especially close those that have spent years contributing to and supporting our faith community. Let us name Helen Brown while her family searches for an assisted living facility for her. We name Pat, Terry, June, Doreen, Ruth, Brian, and Joyce. We name Ruth, Pearl, Mary, Lorraine, Rain, Louise, Bill, Bruce, Bob, and Virginia Rutherford. We name Ken and Marlene Rogerson, Roy and Kim Tompkins, Jack and Glow McCarter. We continue to pray for Diane, Andrea, Liz, and their families as they grieve Clint's death and for the Dawson and Selder families as they wait to celebrate the lives of their loved ones. It is a, complica a complicated and frightening world. Strengthen us as we stand and bear witness to this whole life, the life of the risen one, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray now in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The life and work of this community continues, uh, even when we're not together and doing the things that we are so used to. After worship today, we'll do some breakout rooms and do some fellowship check-in time where you have a chance to connect with some of the folks that are part of this worship uh, experience, some who you may know and some who you have never spoken to before. And so I invite you into that time with uh, some wonder and amazement, perhaps some astonishment, some belief and disbelief, as you uh, might meet someone that you've both been coming to the same church for 40 years and never had a conversation. We'll check in uh, Wednesday at noon and Thursday evening at 6.30 using the same link as for worship. You are welcome to do that. It is a time for you to call in for five minutes or spend uh, 45 minutes with whoever else gathers. It's a good um, way to be together in that and to find some way of connecting and hearing what's going on in people's lives. I would like to start a book study on Brene Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection. Uh, I would like to know what your preferred dates and times would be, whether you want to do it weekly or bi-weekly. Uh, just send me an email or give me a phone call at the office if you don't have email. We want to do it, we'll do it in the same fashion uh, here. If you need help ordering the book, uh, please let me know. Uh, either actually doing it online, ordering the book, or financially ordering uh, and paying for the book, please do let me know will help you get that taken care of. 
uh, The Gifts of Imperfection is available on Amazon and on Chapters Indigo. It's available as downloaded, Kindle, all of those different ways. I only um, suggest the legal ways. If you know other ways, that's up to you to figure that out. As we continue to live in the world, we know that there are some people who are still working more than full time and there are some people who are not working at all. And so financial situation becomes precarious. If you're able and still willing to contribute to the financial life of Jubilee United Church during this time, there are a variety of ways. You can drop off or mail in a donation to the church. Check is better than cash. If you want someone to come and pick it up, we're happy to arrange that as well. We have a few people who are willing to do that. You could join PAR, which is the pre-authorized remittance program. Your donation just automatically comes out of your bank account on the 20th of the month. Um, if you want an application form, you can email the office at jubilee-uc.ca. Uh, if you want to change your amount, either to increase it or decrease it, depending on your situation, we can also do that. Uh, we also receive e-transfers to the office email address if that's a way that you'd like to donate. However, it doesn't matter if you donate or not. We're glad that you're with us for this time of worship. Your presence is a gift. And if you worship with another community regularly, we encourage you to continue to support them. If you um, are unable, we know that you are reaching out with prayers and with hope and with... Uh, communication so we give what we can thank you for your generosity in all that you give and so even though it's weird not to have them here we're still gonna give thanks for these offerings God the offerings of time and talent and treasure may the gifts that we receive be used with wisdom and with justice in the church and throughout the world in our lives where there is both doubt and faith believing and disbelieving, knowing that you are present in all. Amen. So as we finish our worship service, we will gather into some breakout rooms for some fellowship time, uh, some conversation and whatever you need to do. But my friends, like the woman, woman who ran to share the good news of the empty tomb, we go forth with joy. Like the travelers walking the Emmaus road, we go forth with opened eyes. Like the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit, we go forth with peace. Like Thomas, filled with doubt, we go forth with faith. Like fishers pulling heavy nets, we go forth with abundant life. We go forth with God, with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit by our sides, now and forever. Amen. As I have said before, our, our worship ends, but our service continues. And so if you uh, desire to stay for the fellowship time, just hold on a few minutes while I get that set up and um, enjoy some conversation. Thanks for being here today. <laughs>